What is up everybody? In this tutorial, you are gonna code a simple neural network from scratch in the PyTorch framework. That includes backpropagation and stochastic gradient descent with momentum. You don't need any prior experience. We'll cover everything you need to know as we go along. Let's get started. So we start with our imports as usual. So we're going to be pretty light on imports because as I said, we're coding this completely from scratch. We're not going to use a whole lot of built-in functionality from PyTorch. We're just going to need the tensors as well as some stuff from Torch Vision to handle the data set. So speaking of which, from torchvision.datasets, we want to import MNIST. Now MNIST is kind of the canonical example for uh, an introduction to deep learning. Now, if you're not familiar with it, it is just a set of handwritten digits which are 28 by 28 grayscale uh, images. Very handy for uh, an introductory level classification problem. It's a little bit boring, I can admit, but uh, it is a great introduction to using the built-in PyTorch data loaders. And it doesn't require us to do any data cleaning or data pre-processing, which is kind of a messy process and really takes away from the understanding of the uh, the mechanics of the underlying deep neural network and doesn't add a whole lot to it. So we're going to start with this example. You can use any of the other built-in data sets. You can use other data sets that are kind of pre-processed to be compatible with PyTorch. That's always an option. But for this example, we're going to use the handwritten character set from MNIST. Uh, next thing we need are some transforms. We want to import to tensor. So this will take the uh, raw data from the pixels and turn it into PyTorch tensors, a pretty straightforward operation. And we need matplotlib.py plot because we're going to want to plot the cost and accuracy of the performance of our deep neural network over time. So that is it for our imports. Now, keep in mind that typically you will stick these um, the functionality in a class. We're not going to do that here. We're going to take a procedural approach instead of an object-oriented approach. Reason being that there's no real benefit. We're not going to be building on this later to make a library. So uh, sticking, sticking everything in separate functions is just as good as sticking it in a class. So this is a much cleaner implementation. So uh, that being said, the first function I want to take care of is one hot encoding. Now this is uh, also built into PyTorch, we could use the PyTorch built-in implementation, but I said we're doing this from scratch, which means we're going to implement as much on our own as possible to maximize our understanding, right? That's the goal here, to learn and understand everything about the deep neural network process. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so this will take a vector y and num labels as input. And since we're dealing with the MNIST data set, the default is 10 for 0 through 9. Now, if you're not familiar with one-hot encoding, what this is, is it takes a number, say 0 through 9, and turns it into an array of zeros with a 1 corresponding to the position of the class it is. So if it is a character 0, it will be a vector of 1 and then 8 zeros following it, or 9 zeros following it. If it is a, let's say two, it'll be zero, zero, one, and then a bunch of zeros after that. Likewise for all the others. So it's just an array of zeros with a one in the position that corresponds to the class that it is classified as. So one hot equals t dot zeros, num labels y dot shape sub zero. Next up, we want to say for i val in enumerate that vector y one one hot sub val i equals 1.0 that is it that's very straightforward return one hot so just a few line function to do a one hot encoding uh not really necessary to stick it in its own function it's just because we're going to be doing this a few times so we don't want to repeat ourselves next thing we have to address is uh, adding a bias unit to our deep neural network so uh, before we get into that let's talk a little bit about what deep neural networks are so a deep neural network is really a matrix. So it is a matrix that tells you how the uh, inputs are transformed into the next layer of your deep neural network. So it is an input layer, one hidden layer, a second hidden layer, and then in this case, an output layer. So the output layer will correspond to the probabilities of the image belonging to one of the classes. The input layer is just the flattened 28 by 28 or I think that's 768, something like that. Don't quote me on that uh, pixel image in a flattened form that's passed through. And then each neuron, each of the units in the hidden layers is connected to all of the other uh, neurons in the uh, next layer. So 
that is represented as a matrix. So you multiply your input vector by some matrix and that gives you your uh, hidden layer. Then you perform some activation on it. And so we have what are called bias units that represent what you would get if all of your weights were zero. So in the event that all the weights go to zero, you still have some bias in there. And you can think of this as kind of like being an equation for a straight line, y equals mx plus b. That b is a bias. It tells you what the value of the equation is when x is zero. Very, very similar for a deep neural network. Uh, and there are two different ways. We're gonna handle some transposes of the matrices in the middle here. So we have to account for two different ways of adding in a bias unit. It can either be along a row or a column. So we have to account for both. So our function will take a layer as input, which is just basically a vector, and then an orientation, which tells us how we want to add the uh, new bias unit. So if we wanna add it as a row, then we say new layer equals t dot ones uh, layer dot shape sub zero, not zero nine zero uh, plus one because we're adding a row and layer dot shape sub one. And then we want to say new layer, good grief, new layer sub one onward all columns equals layer. So whatever layer we've passed in, we're going to add this after the first position. So the first position just ends up being bias values of one, and then uh, the, uh, the la new layer is just gonna be equal to the old layer from then on. Now don't worry, these bias units can get modified layer later. Uh, they're not stuck at one, but we're just gonna pick that to start with because you gotta start somewhere. So otherwise, if the orientation is column wise, then you say new layer equals t dot ones, layer dot shape, uh, zero, zero, comma, layer dot shape one plus one. And then uh, new layer, all rows, column one onward equals layer. And then when you're done, just return the new layer. Very, very straightforward. Our next question we have to deal with is how are we going to initialize the weights? How are we going to, in other words, how will we initialize these matrices, right? Because the weights are a matrix. And if you didn't catch it the first time, the weights tell us the relative, uh, relative importance of each pixel in the input image. Now there's a little bit of wiggle room in that interpretation within the uh, uh, deeper hidden layers because then you're not dealing with the actual input image, you're dealing with some features of the input image, you know, what the neural network thinks is important about those uh, images. But the point remains the same. You have to start somewhere. And so we have to do an initialization function. So we say def, uh, init weights, and then I'll take the <laughs> that'll take the um, number of input units, number of hidden units for uh, first hidden unit uh, layer, number of hidden units for second hidden layer, number of output units, and a batch size. So I haven't spoken on this yet, but we're going to be doing batch stochastic gradient descent. That means we're going to be taking chunks of the input data and performing gradient descent on that rather than a single entry. So a batch in this case means a set of input images, a set of 28 by 28 images. So we say W1, the weight for the first layer equals T dot rand n, random normal, n hidden one by n input plus one. We need the plus one because we're going to be adding biased units and d type equals t dot float. Now, PyTorch is quite particular about data types. It is uh, kind of a good thing because I don't think PyTorch is, a, uh, excuse me, Python is a very strongly typed language. So PyTorch kind of, you know, enforces some type of strictness on the typing, which is pretty good. So it'll bark at you if you do something funny with the data types. So I tend to be a little bit more verbose in PyTorch as opposed to something like Keras or TensorFlow. And so I'm specifying t.float instead of something like t.double or, you know, uh, long or whatever. So w2 equals t.rand n, n hidden to n hidden one plus one again, because we're going to have a bias unit. D type equals t.float and w3 is random normal n, uh, sorry, n output by n hidden two plus one, and e type equals t dot float. And then just return one weights one, two, and three. So that handles kind of all of the 
uh, bookkeeping type functions, the initialization, one hot encoding, and adding of bias units. Now we can get onto the business of actually constructing a deep neural network. So the first thing we want to handle is a forward pass. What this means is you, an input image comes in one end, it gets flattened, and then uh, passed through, acted upon by a matrix, activated, and then acted upon by another matrix, activated, and then uh, fed to the output. So we have a few different operations to handle here, and we'll call it compute forward pass. It takes an input vector, weights one, weights two, and weights three. They just get passed as um, the weights, we think it get passed as parameters to the function. So we say a1 equals t dot reshape input shape equals uh, input dot shape zero minus one. So we're basically going to uh, reshape along the batch dimension and then we want to say add bias unit a1 orientation equals column so we're going to add a set of bias units to as a column uh, because the image gets uh, the input vectors are a column vector then we're going to say what's called z2 is w1 dot matrix multiply t dot transpose a1, 0, and 1. So we're going to transpose that vector and matrix multiply it with W1. And that is the first feed forward. But what we need to do next is do the actual um, activation. And that's t.sigmoid Z2. So that is the activated output of the first matrix multiplication. And uh, that is basically the uh, first operation in a deep neural network. Congratulations, we're almost there. Next up, we want to say um, add a bias unit. A2 equals add bias unit. A2 orientation equals row. Now that we've transposed it, we have to put the vector along a row. And then we say uh, Z3 equals W2 dot matrix, matrix multiply A2. And A3 equals T dot sigmoid Z3. And likewise, A3 equals add bias unit. A3 orientation equals row. And then for our output of the deep neural network, Z4 equals weight 3, mat mall A3. Just take the A3 activated vector and act upon it with the weight 3 matrix and say A4 equals T dot sigmoid Z4. And we don't have to worry about a bias unit here, but we are done. So what this has done is uh, reshaped our vector, added a bias unit, and then performed the matrix multiplications and activations. One thing I didn't explain is the sigmoid function. The sigmoid function is kind of a way of squashing an input. So what it does is for uh, extremely negative or extremely positive numbers, it reduces it to either minus one or positive one respectively. And for anything in between the interval like minus 0.5 to positive 0.5, it's approximately equal to whatever that input is. Um, slightly different, but you know, close enough for government work, right? So next, after performing all of the feed forwards, we need to say return A1, Z2, uh, sorry, Z2, don't wanna mess up that ordering, nothing will work. Uh, A2, Z3, A3, Z4, A4. So we wanna pass back out all of the activated and unactivated inputs because we're gonna use them later. So next, we have to worry about something uh, uh, called predicting. In other words, we're going to pass in an input and say what is the, uh, we're going to pass in an output vector, excuse me, and say what is the class of that particular output vector. And that gets its own function. It's very straightforward. It's going to take A4 as input, the activated output of the deep neural network. And it will say prediction equals T to argmax a4 dimension equals zero, so it'll predict along the zeroth dimension and return prediction. Now, I'm looking at this, and one way this could be improved, I believe, is that these probabilities uh, aren't going to add up to one. So th there uh, is no, and they could even be negative now that I'm looking at it. So perhaps sigmoid may be something to improve upon. There are softmax functions that are better for activation functions at the last layer. This is kind of a naive implementation. Um, I'll leave it as an exercise to the viewer to go back and improve upon this. We're going to see that you get actually pretty decent results with the sigmoid anyway, so it isn't a huge deal, but if you want to get 
better results, then one way to improve would be to turn this from a sigmoid to something like a softmax, which is a um, kind of like a weighted exponential function that guarantees that the sum of the elements of that output vector add up to one because these are really probabilities. But, you know, this is a basic implementation, very, very straightforward. So we're just going to live with the limitations I've given you. Uh, of course, you can fork it and do as you wish. But for now, we're going to live with the sigmoid. So next, we want to compute a loss function. That takes a prediction and a label. Now, if you're not familiar with it, the loss tells us how far away the prediction and the label are in parameter space. And the deep neural network always seeks to minimize that loss over time. That's how it knows how to adjust the weights. It says, okay, I have a large loss. So the shimmy with the weights. See how that affects the loss. Oh, okay, the loss got better, so keep moving in that direction. That's the gist of gradient descent is vary the weights, observe the change in the loss, and move in the direction of the downhill slope in this high dimensional parameter space. Uh, and this is going to be a somewhat complicated function. Um, I'm not going to worry about deriving it here, uh, but you can look at a treatise or a work on deep neural networks to um, see where this comes from. It's basically a similar loss function to any type of logistic regression. Uh, it has some neat properties that it must have, but we're going to go ahead and run with it for now. So term one equals minus one times label times t dot log tensor uh, pytorch dot log of prediction, and term two equals one minus label times t dot log one minus prediction. Uh, I feel like I have uh, one too few parentheses there and then we want to say, sum them say loss equals t dot sum term one minus term two and return the loss so that's our loss function that we're going to try to minimize over time next we have to get to the kind of the beast of the problem the backward propagation so let's talk about this for a second so back propagation is uh, the process by which the deep neural network reduces the uh, shimmies are the weights to reduce the cost over time. So after you feed forward, you know, your weights are fixed and you say, okay, what is my cost with the prediction that I received? And then you say, okay, if I start at the end and then start working backwards and playing with the weights, how can I minimize that loss at the end? So it's kind of a backward pass through the neural network once you already have the output. The goal of it is to calculate the changes in the weights such that uh, you can um, perform gradient stochastic gradient descent in this case so com <laughs> hand placement is important compute backward pass uh, we need the weights which is just going to be a tuple outputs and label so I've kind of compressed stuff here so I have to uncompress it say w1 w2 w3 equals weights that's just to save space in the function declaration a1 z2 uh, A2, Z3, A3, Z4, A4 equals outputs. Um, must be very, very careful here. Let me look at my cheat sheet to make sure I didn't mess up the ordering because if the ordering is messed up, it might throw a dimensional error, uh, but more insidious, it may not and just kind of give me a poor performance and then I have to go hunting for it. Looks good though. So we start with the, the difference between the output and our label. So delta equals A4 minus label. Okay, so that tells us how far away our prediction is from the actual label we've been given by the training data. And, and then delta 3 equals T dot transpose W3 all rows first column onward. Um, sorry, W3 not W2 because we want to ignore the bias unit. Uh, 0 comma 1 dot matrix multiply delta 4 times split to a new line T dot sigmoid Z3 times 1 minus T dot sigmoid of Z3 this is just the derivative of Z3 uh, using the chain rule um, and then say delta 2 equals W2 all rows first column onward dot matrix multiply delta three times t dot sigmoid z2 z2 times one minus t dot sigmoid of z2 and then the, that's all we need for the back prop we need to deal with the 
gradients then. So gradient W1 equals delta 2 dot matrix multiply A1. Grad W2 equals delta 3 dot matrix multiply T dot transpose A2, 0, 1. And grad W3 delta 4 dot matrix multiply T dot transpose a3, 0, 1, comma, 1. Make that consistent. And then we want to return our gradients. W2 and grad W3. So I'm going to do a more detailed video later on the mathematical theory behind this. This particular tutorial is concerned with the uh, high level uh, conceptual understanding and the implementation in code. Uh, this is so that I don't bog down one particular video with too much material and then perhaps later on I will kind of uh, release a, a remaster remix version with everything all in one video so people get everything they need in one place. Uh, so next we have handled the the um, heavy lifting of the deep neural network which is the backward pass, the loss, predictions, and forward pass and now we have to deal with some PyTorch stuff which is a function to get the data and that'll take a train batch size and a test batch size we'll default that to 10 just for fun say mnist train data equals mnist um, and the directory uh, we'll have to make it later is mnist um, let me do this here something in my uh, cheat sheet before I upload to GitHub, I don't want it to say the wrong thing. I was playing around with the fashion MNIST uh, data set, which is images of like clothing. Uh, it's a little bit more interesting than the uh, uh, characters, the numbers, but uh, you know, whatever, it's all kind of boring. So um, what we need is the training data and it will default to a directory of MNIST. Train is true, download is true, and the transform equals to tensor. And I, no, I don't think I can stick that all in one line. Uh, so before we run the program, we're gonna have to make a directory called mnist, and we'll say train data loader. What this is is a data loader. So once we download the data, we have to actually have a function to uh, parse it and process it, and that'll say t utils data dot data loader mnist train data comma batch size equals train batch size uh, shuffle equals true and num workers equals eight so the num workers is the number of threads it's going to use um, this is a multi-threaded application uh, so if you have a big beefy cpu with a bunch of cores then by all means use as many cores as you can uh, and spoiler alert this all takes place on the cpu so uh, we're not going to be making any use of the CUDA GPUs, uh, the, the GPUs or any of the CUDA tensors. So it is a little bit slow, but the data set is so simple that it's fast enough. So um, next, I'm going to cheat a little bit and copy this MNIST test data uh, and say train equals false, download equals true, and transform equals to tensor. So it knows automatically by setting the train equals false flag that we intend this to be uh, testing data. And then we want a test data loader as well. Definitely have to change the name, test data loader, MNIST test data and test batch size and shuffle true, num workers eight, that's all good. Return train data loader, test data loader. All right, so we have all of the functionality we need. Now we can handle our main loop. So we'll say if name equals uh, main. <laughs> if name equals main, perhaps we'll learn how to type one day. Batch size equals 50 and input equals 28 by 28 because the images are 28 pixels by 28 pixels. Sorry, I'm trying to navigate around a cat here. Uh, okay, so next we're going to define the parameters of our network and hidden one and hidden two and 
output equals 100, 100, and 10. So we'll deal with two hidden layers of 100 ne uh, neurons each and 10 neurons in the output layer because that corresponds to the number of classes we have. So if you want to modify this to a data set with different number of classes, then this number of output must be modified. Otherwise, you're going to get totally screwy predict predictions and it won't do anything useful for you. Next, we want to do our initialization of our weights. Say W1, W2, W3 equals init weights and uh, input and hidden one and hidden two and, and output and batch size. So let's stick that on its own line just for good formatting. And then we say uh, we have to deal with our hyperparameters. So uh, in stochastic gradient descent, what you're doing is you are, as you saw here, uh, not exactly clear from the mathematics, but the idea is we're starting at the end of the uh, process and saying what is the delta between our label and our prediction. And then we're going to try to work backwards and minimize those quantities. We get something that's defined as uh, called gradient W1, gradient W2, gradient W3. So we will take steps in parameter space that are proportional to gradient W1, gradient W2, and gradient W3. And those steps will be proportionate up to a constant, which is a hyperparameter of our model, which conveniently is called eta. That is our learning rate. We also have the alpha parameter, and that is our momentum factor. And the number of epochs we want to train is 250. We get pretty good results after 250 epochs. You could probably get better results training longer, but you know, whatever. Let's just go with good enough for now. Next up, we say delta w1 previous equals t dot zeros w1 dot shape. What this is, is the previous value of the gradients of w1, w2, and w3, and this will be related to our momentum. So I'll get to that in a minute. I don't want to get you know, two sidetrack for the moment, t dot zeros, w2 dot shape, and delta w3 previous, t dot zeros, w3 dot shape, uh, train losses equals an empty list. This will just be a list to keep track of the losses during the training phase. And the accuracy is similar, it just tells us how accurate our model is. Next, we want to load up our data, say train data, test data equals get data, batch size. Remember, we have a default value of 10 for the testing data. Uh, now we want to iterate over the number of epochs for i in range num epochs for j input and label and enumerate train data. What we're going to do is we're going to enumerate the train data loader. And of course, this is the index J and it'll give us um, an input and a label. The input is just the image from the uh, data set and the label is whatever character it actually is. So the first thing we want to do is get our one hot label and label. And just to be pedantic, we'll say num labels equals 10 to make sure we remember. Uh, and then we want to do our forward propagation. So A1, Z2, A2, Z3, A3, Z4, A4 equals compute forward pass. And that is input W1, W2, W3. Then the loss equals compute loss. A4, that's our output. One hot label dot float. Uh, the one hot label gives us a tensor. We want the actual number, so we have to pass in dot float. Then we can say grad one, grad two, grad three, compute backward pass. And remember, we do this um, unpacking here, so I have to pack them up first. Pass in a list w1, w2, w, <laughs> w3. I am really on a roll today. A1, uh, Z2, A2, Z3, A3, Z4, and A4, and the label we want to handle. One hot label dot float. Again, it has to be an actual number. Uh, so that will compute our backward pass. 
for stochastic gradient descent. Uh, just a quick note, what makes it stochastic? It is stochastic, meaning random, because we are shuffling our data. So we are not getting confined to any one particular corner of parameter space, but we are kind of jumping around as we shuffle through the uh, batch of data. Then we say delta w1, delta w2, delta w3. So this is by how much we want to change the, the, the weights of our deep neural network. And that's eta times grad one, eta times grad two, and eta times grad three. And then we want to say um, w1 minus equals delta w1, sorry, plus delta w1 <laughs> previous times alpha. So alpha is our momentum factor. And so just so that I can be a little bit lazy, let's go ahead and copy and paste a couple of times, taking care to change the appropriate variable names. So what this will do is if you didn't want to use momentum, you could set alpha to zero, in which case it's just negative delta w1, negative delta w2. Uh, but if we do want momentum, then you have alpha times this quantity delta w1 previous, which is what? Delta uh, starts out as an array of zeros. Delta w1 previous um, delta w2 previous delta w3 previous equals delta w1 delta w2 delta w3. So we're going to save the old values of the deltas in the delta w1, w2, w3 previous. Uh, so that way we can keep track of our momentum for the next step. Once we're done with all of that, we want to say train losses dot append loss predictions equals predict a4. And one other quantity we may want to be interested in is how many we get wrong. Um, because that is related to our accuracy. T dot where predictions not equal to label uh, t dot tensor one or t dot tensor zero. So if it is not equal to, it gets a one. If it is equal to, it gets a zero. Uh, that's just kind of how the PyTorch where function works. So if if statement is true, assign this. If not, assign that. Not exactly clear, but that's just how it is. So then we want to say accuracy equals one minus t dot sum wrong divided by batch size. We have to scale by the batch size. And then finally train accuracy append accuracy dot float. We have to do that dot float again because the accuracy is a um, tensor and we want to get the value out of it. At the end of the epoch, we want to say print. Maybe one more indent there, print epoch i training accuracy sent to f percent t dot mean t dot tensor train accuracy dot item dot item is another way of getting the uh, value out of a pytorch tensor so that is it for the training this looks like a lot Really, it's only 140 lines, but the basic idea is iterate over your data set, convert your numerical label to a one-hot encoding, compute your forward pass, compute your loss, do the back propagation to, the, to get the gradients of the weights with respect to the uh, deep neural network, and then go ahead and calculate the uh, changes in the weights based on the learning rate, and then go ahead and increment your weights, in, uh, which is going to be uh, equal to the negatives, uh, it's going to be subtracted by the quantity W1, delta W1 plus delta W1 previous times the momentum factor. And then keep track of your old momentums for uh, the next step. And then just do some basic stuff to calculate how accurate you are on each time step. Very, very simple. Uh, next, we're going to do a bunch of figure stuff. You know what? I am just going to cut and paste because this is really really mundane and I don't like doing super mundane stuff but what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a figure we're gonna add some subplots uh, it's gonna have uh, a couple labels 
red and blue uh, iterations versus loss and accuracy versus iterations and they'll be on the left and right labels respectively uh, next what we want to do after showing the plot is print out a bunch of uh, gobbledygook here to kind of clear the space and say print uh, evaluate test data because we do want to evaluate how we perform on test data we don't want to just do the training data and the reason is that deep neural networks have a tendency to overtrain, meaning that they do really really well on the training data but don't generalize well to test data and so we don't want that we want something that generalizes well that we can feed new examples and get a highly accurate answer otherwise what's the point you know if it's only really good on the training data it's not really any good so we're gonna handle that and it's very straightforward with we'll say test accuracy is an empty list for J input label in enumerate test data again we're gonna use a test data loader and enumerate over it again you want the one hot label one hot encoding of the label num labels is 10 again we're not changing data sets so 10 labels we want to perform a forward propagation again on the test data z2 a2 z3 a3 z4 a4 equals compute forward pass input w1 w2 w3 i can get rid of that space there so these are just the weights that we arrived at after training for 250 epochs and input is just the input from our uh, test data set and we want to compute the loss compute loss um, a4 one hot label dot float next we want prediction equals predict a4 i think i called that predictions let's be a little bit more precise and say wrong equals t dot where predictions not equal to label t dot tensor one else t dot tensor zero prediction is not equal to label uh, I feel like I'm missing something here t dot tensor I am aha right there uh, I hate that auto add for parentheses that's super annoying accuracy equals 1 minus t dot sum wrong divided by batch size and test accuracy dot append accuracy Notice we're not doing any backward propagation because we have already trained our deep neural network. We don't want to train it anymore. This is the evaluation or testing phase. And when we're done iterating and accumulating the total losses, uh, sorry, the accuracies over the test data, we want to say testing accuracy percent dot 2f percent t dot mean t dot tensor test ac dot item. Do I have one too many? I feel like I have one too many. I do not. I do here, right there. There we go. So that is the program in a nutshell. Let's head to the terminal and see how many typos I made. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is make der mnist. That is for downloading the data. I don't think it'll make it for us. Uh, so we have to say Python simple neural network mnist.py. Yeah, so it's downloading our data as expected, processing, it's done. And it is training. I didn't make any typos. That is twice in the last month. I'm on a roll. So you can see that the training accuracy is going up over time. That is clear indication of learning. Uh, let's come over here to the other window where I ran this and it kind of plateaus out around 95 percent accuracy which isn't too bad for such a naive deep neural network you know just a couple of sets of parameters uh, chosen kind of out of nowhere um, but when you f it finishes and gets the plot it should look something like this where you can see the loss go down over time and the training accuracy roughly go up over time uh, hitting some maximum mean value of around 0.95 so that is deep uh, re, uh, deep learning in a nutshell. All it really is, 
and it you know it may seem mysterious but all it really is is a set of matrix operations where the elements of the matrices tell you the relative weights of the features and for the case of the first layer the features are the input pixels from your image and so the weights tell you the relative importance of each of those pixels in classifying the image and then successive layers uh, what they do is they kind of select features in other words clumps of images uh, clumps of pixels uh, different parts of the image that it thinks is important in classifying the final image that's really all it is and it you know compares that output uh, of the deep neural network to whatever the label is and then tries to play with those weights to minimize that delta so that way it can get the most accurate predictions pro uh, possible other innovation is that it uh, iterates over the batch in a sort of random fashion by shuffling it the reason you do this is because if you were to feed it all one label and then all another label like all zeros all ones all twos in sequence then what you're doing is you are basically biasing it towards one or another portion of parameter space this causes uh, poor generalization because it gets kind of caught in nukes and crannies of parameter space you have to remember that this is a 100 by 100 by 10 uh, what is that uh, 100,000 roughly times 28 by 28 uh, uh, so you know several million uh, element space you know very very high dimensional space and so as a, you know obviously you can't imagine that but suffice it to say it'll have a bunch of nooks and crannies hills and valleys uh, with respect to the cost function as a function of the weights of the deep neural network so i hope this has been helpful leave a comment a share if you found it helpful uh and in the next sequence of videos, we're going to look at how to actually use a convolutional neural network uh, using the PyTorch layers. We're going to move on to doing something more sophisticated using the PyTorch layers. Look at a few different ways of constructing uh, sequential models and using actual convolutional neural networks uh, as well as some data augmentation to do uh, image classification. So subscribe so you don't miss that. Leave a comment down below. Hit the notification bell because I know only 14% of you get my notifications. And I'll see you all in the next video.